Our next presentation will be given by Joe Cornelius, the Chief Executive Officer for Bill and Melinda Gates Agricultural Innovations, which is known as Gates Ag One. The title of his talk is Innovations to Improve Agriculture, Productivity and Sustainability in the Face of Global Climate Change. From a Bill and Melinda Gates uh, perspective, I'd like to build on uh, what uh, Don actually set the stage for. And as an organization that uh, often calls itself um, uh, impatient optimists, there are a lot of points of intersection as we think about agriculture. Uh, and what I'd like to lay out for the next 25 minutes are the challenges, many of which we've discussed over the last two days of the workshop and the opportunities uh, going forward. All right, um, so from a, <clears throat> from a historical perspective, agriculture has been uh, an enabler of for civilization and agriculture as we know it uh, is really about domesticating both crops and animals. And over the course of time, the agricultural sector has actually um, had numerous inflection points. Uh, in this particular case, uh, if we look back, um, going back to uh, Neolithic uh, period, there have been at least three major uh, um, agricultural re revolutions that have occurred during this particular period. One thing that I think is particularly interesting about the the uh, timeline or chronology is that we seem to keep butting our heads against the same problems, whether it's population growth, uh, climate, um, and ultimately it's technology that's actually been a primary driver of, of our ability to actually uh, uh, move to the next century. The key question for us uh, where we are today is are we gonna be able to actually close this gap uh, between now and 2050, and more importantly, uh, between now and, and the end of the, to end of the 21st century? One chart that actually is pointed to quite regularly as an achievement of the agricultural sector is the significant uh, progress that's been made in the last 75 years and in this particular chart showing uh, maize in, in North America. There are comparable charts in Europe for other cereal grains, um, but I would also challenge that this is not only a success story, it's also a, um, uh, a story that's actually been enabled by uh, inexpensive energy, mechanization, uh, uh, fertilizer, uh, uh, and a number of other significant um, uh, innovations that have actually enabled the growth, but have also created uh, scenarios that now we as a civilization have to address and, and clean up. The key thing also about this chart uh, is that yields are starting to plateau. And across the board, <clears throat> all the crops are seeing this uh, similar uh, effect Actually, several crops are in a negative year-over-year -year growth. Uh, corn, which gets the lion's share of the R&D investment from the private sector, is growing at a, at a scant uh, one to two percent per year. Um, so the food security is uh, one of the issues that we've touched on, that uh, basically we have to increase agricultural pr productivity by roughly uh, doubling between now and, and 2050 and at the same time do that without bringing any additional land mass into planting. If we were to just use the current yield um, curves that we're on, that would require our, our finding a land mass the size of North, Car of, of North America to actually be able to satisfy that need. So basically that's not going to happen. And we've got to look at uh, agriculture as stepping up to be able to close that gap in, in other ways besides uh, procuring additional land. Next slide. Fresh water is also a significant challenge from an agricultural perspective. 70% of the blue water or the potable water that we drink actually goes to agriculture and 40% of the land that is being cultivated is currently under irrigation. 
This is a bank account that we've been drawing down over the last century. Um, and basically we have to find uh, a better alternative to current existing farm practice. Next slide. Land use, uh, uh, arguably the, the most important single greenhouse gas challenge we have, whether it be deforestation or just the cultivation of, of cropland year over year. Um, we basically have to find uh, better uh, farming practices that allow us to manage this in a more sustainable, sustainable fashion. Next slide. And if we look at the productivity gains that have actually procured to agriculture, it's been at a significant cost to the environment. Um, we, several of the speakers previously spoke about uh, hypoxia uh, as an example. Half of the fertilizer we put on the farmland uh, ultimately ends up in fresh waterways and has deleterious effects uh, globally that have to be uh, uh, reversed. And essentially all of us are going to be impacted by climate, but no one more severely than those who are trying to uh, farm in Sub-Saharan Africa. Of the 500 plus million farms uh, around the world, uh, disproportionately those that are in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia are being uh, uh, severely impacted by a number of different climatic effects, not just drought, but also uh, disease and insect pattern shifts that we're seeing on a, on a mega scale that are having significant uh, impl implications. Next slide. And of all the sectors that exist uh, at our disposal, agriculture is a pathway to, to equality for all economies. Um, and this is a particularly important aspect as we think about low-income countries and their ability to actually move to a more sustainable economic model. Next slide. All right, so doom and gloom is over. Let's now change gears and talk about the optimistic. Agriculture is biology, and as a result, it's actually can become a significant contributor to what we're trying to, to solve here. Genetics are programmable, as Don alluded to in the, in the previous um, uh, presentation, that like software, we have the capability to actually improve the genetics that we are currently uh, farming. Uh, said another way is we don't have to play with the deck that we have. Uh, seeds are scalable. Um, all the genetics that we develop are actually are very specific to the spe a specific geography. Subsequently, we can customize and deliver those uh, improvements, genetic improvements um, globally. And carbon is currency uh, to, a, to, to the farm or agricultural system, whether it's carbon in grain or carbon in soil, at the end of the day, it's monetized. Subsequently, it has a, a uh, economic incentive that's aligned with uh, the objectives that we're trying to achieve. Next slide. The uh, Academy actually published a report that came out uh, this year uh, and it was, um, the workshop was conducted last year that outlined fields of opportunity from an agricultural research perspective. Um, and these break down into a number of different buckets such as uh, efficiency, sustainability, and uh, resiliency. Um, increasing nutrient use, reducing soil lo loss, uh, mobilizing genetic diversity are very much in that high efficiency bucket. Um, optimizing water use, improving food uh, and anim animal genetics, uh, early and rapid detection, um, as well as reducing food loss. These are all low hanging fruit. Um, in the context from a research perspective that we do have tools and, um, and, and paths or, or, or particular strategies that can allow us to actually impact these, these areas. Next slide. 
What I'd like to talk about in the context of nat natural climate solutions from an agricultural innovations perspective, that there are two particular inflections that we can actually um, focus on in the near mid uh, term that actually have long term consequences. One is precision breeding and, and the other is knowledge farming. Two very overused terms, but two that are, are quite important going forward. First, I'll talk about precision breeding. Um, breeding is very inefficient. It's basically just like photosynthesis that Don talked about, that inefficiency gets amplified by the fact that it takes us another eight to 12 years, even when we find a, a, or discover genes of interest to be able to move that into a commercial context. Uh, the process of crossing parents, conducting field evaluations, uh, and that ultimate, uh, ultimately translate into um, uh, commercial uh, hybrids and varieties is a very slow um, uh, methodic uh, process. And what particularly slows it down is the fact that we truly need to understand the genotype by environment by management uh, attributes as it relates to uh, crop breeding. Uh, next slide. So on the left, a, a figure that most of you are, are probably familiar with, Norman Borlaug, who has been very, um, who is very much involved on the Green Revolution side. What I want to talk about is what Mendel um, started um, uh, several centuries ago, and that was our understanding of breeding and what are the variables that go into breeding that actually allow us to realize genetic gain. And in this particular context, talking about genetic gain uh, as a phenotype of interest. Um, uh, and what we're looking for are the outliers in a normal distribution. Um, this is a very um, simplified version of that equation. What I want to highlight in this graphic is the fact that there are several parameters that a breeder is trying to optimize in order to get to the next generation uh, trait. Um, once they discover a gene, what they want to make sure is that it's heritable, that it actually can be passed down from the parent to its progeny. And it's important to understand how the phenotype in this particular case could be yield or it could be disease tolerance or it could be uh, a carbon partitioning, how that effect is influenced by genetics by environment. And it's a function of, of how the breeder actually conducts their activity uh, how much phenotypic variability do they have in their trials, what kind of selection intensity, and what's the length of the cycle that they're running on their breeding. At the end of the day, the clock speed can be affected by our ability to either uh, impact the numerator or, or the denominator in this particular equation and actually increase the number of breeding cycles uh, on an annual basis. Next slide. So once a breeder actually is successful in creating a new commercial hybrid or variety, then it moves into the farmer's field, um, where the farmers, where the breeder's trying to actually increase genetic gain, the farmer is trying to optimize what the breeder hands them. And the farmer is actually battling with nature on a day-to-day -day basis. During the course of the year, they're making several hundred uh, critical decisions that any one of which can determine success or failure from a productivity standpoint. And certainly uh, most of those, if not all of those, have significant impacts on sustainability. Next slide. So a, a quote I came across in Nature uh, several years ago, which just resonated with me, was that science is informed by what it is possible to measure, and it takes great leap forward when we measure something new. Next slide. And fortunately, we're, we are all living in this age of convergence. And the question is, can we actually um, integrate these technologies, biology, genomics, engineering, data analytics, mathematics, into the fourth agricultural revolution? Next slide. So Dom touched on just one aspect of this innovation frontier, which is biotechnology. We saw a, an explosion of activity in genomics uh, at the turn of this um, of the century. 
We've also seen significant other omics breakthroughs that have, that have occurred. And we now actually have the means to actually be able to discover genes and traits that actually impact a number of pathways, one of which is carbon fixing photosynthesis that was uh, discussed by Dom. We've also have genes and traits that affect carbon simul assimilation and transport, which can actually enable us to think about um, ways to optimize uh, root shoot partitioning differently than we've had before. The ability to identify new genes that actually have greater recalcitrance, which uh, have impact on, on soil carbon. Um, genes that potentially affect water use efficiency, as well as self-fertilizing uh, plants. So we have multiple strategies that we can actually address that would actually go very, um, would contribute toward our ability to adapt and mitigate a number of, of climatic uh, factors that we're facing. And all of this we know has to be done um, in addition to uh, uh, being able to make the plans more uh, abiotic and biotic stress tolerant as a result of the uh, challenges that, that we're facing. The good news is that we've seen productivity in the space. This was an article that was actually published uh, in the Wall Street Journal just several weeks ago, August 12th, uh, the robot producing the crops of the future. This was a test bed that was developed by the Department of Energy along with USDA um, and uh, NSF uh, uh, several years ago. Uh, and the primary objective of this was to actually create a test bed that would allow us to um, conduct high throughput testing of genotype by phenotype uh, by environmental uh, conditions. It's on a, um, on a site that's approximately two hectares. Um, it's in the desert of uh, Arizona, so it allows us to actually phenotype on a, on a 12 month uh, basis. Um, in addition to its work on developing biology um, uh, discovery efforts, it also provides um, very um, high resolution data sets that can actually be innovated ar around. Uh, and it also provides us with the capability to uh, bring in new sensor modalities and test those on crops as we think about uh, developing um, uh, high throughput capabilities. It also has a place in our ground truthing, our satellite network, and potentially uh, creating uh, better informed uh, algorithms that can be used in other uh, deployment vehicles like uh, drones and, and, uh, and small robots. Next slide. Uh, just a short video. Um, I don't know if you can click that to start. Um, so this is uh, showing the, uh, uh, the scanalyzer that's uh, used in the field. It uh, weighs approximately, uh, I'm not sure if it was 20 tons or 30 tons, but it essentially has every sensor that uh, we currently are, uh, that's known to, to, uh, uh, to civilization and provides us with an opportunity to be able to identify uh, sensors and down select so that we can then, then take those sensors and use them in more deployable uh, formats. Uh, it's a system that basically runs 24 seven and it's a collaboration between the public and, and private sector. The end game is for us to get to small deployable units like this or, or drones that can actually be scalable or, or low cost and can provide farmers with information about crop stand, uh, insect and disease pressure, uh, soil moisture, all the other parameters that actually enable uh, knowledge farming and allow them to actually be much more um, uh, responsible with the resources that they put into their agricultural platforms. So as we think about the integration of physical and life sciences, um, you can go through the, the next couple of clicks to fill out the slide. We see things, uh, innovations on the physical science side around sensing, power analytics, and communications that are directly attributable to biology. Um, on the sensing front, uh, microclimate sensors, metabolic, chemical, nutrient, biologic, uh, are all examples of things that are currently in the process of being um, atomized and, and deployed. 
We also see new technologies like acoustic that, for example, can pick up insect feeding or anomaly detection using advanced data analytics where we can actually identify disruptions in a field using satellite imagery long before uh, human eye or even robotics can do uh, on, a, uh, on a field scale. Uh, new power systems that basically are uh, uh, low power. Um, DARPA had a program called Zero Power as, as an example. There's energy harvesting, which has been around for quite some time. The question is, can we make um, uh, these systems uh, biodegradable? Uh, and can we also find ways that actually uh, leverage the existing um, uh, uh, latency that exists within the uh, plants themselves. From an analytics perspective, uh, building uh, state-of-the-art uh, data sets that allow us to actually create um, much better uh, algorithms using mach machine learning, and also uh, uh, building out uh, the models, more uh, providing the models with more informed uh, information so that we actually uh, have better predictive platforms. And then from a communication standpoint, uh, remember most of agriculture is in very remote uh, sites. So our ability to actually be able to create new uh, communication cap uh, capabilities that will operate any place in the world um, is, is of particular interest in our fields of opportunity that are currently un under development. And if we look at computing capacity now, getting down to the size of a, a grain of sand. All right, next slide. For the last 10,000 years, we've only bred for what we can see, which means that we've pretty much ignored anything below, uh, below the soil surface. Uh, and this is a particular example showing rooting depth that has been totally ignored by breeders for um, since the beginning of time. Next slide. Taking technologies that are coming from aerospace as well as um, uh, military and, and, um, and oil drilling as, as an example and, and medicine, we're actually uh, repurposing those technologies that allow us to actually be able to measure uh, root growth as well as soil physical characteristics uh, real time. So rather than wait, uh, having to wait 10 years before we've got measurable uh, uh, data, being able to do things uh, on a much uh, shorter uh, time horizon. And these are just two examples of, of using uh, x-ray root imaging uh, or using uh, thermoacoustic imaging to actually be able to allow us to uh, make new measurements that can speed up the breeding pr uh, process but also can potentially become new tools that actually allow farming to be uh, more sustainable. Next slide. So at the end of the day, what, <clears throat> what we're um, uh, asking for is the integration of biology, engineering, and, and data science. In this particular domain, there are significant advancements occurring in each one of these nodes, genomics, phenomics, sensors, robotics, data analytics. But the integration of these technologies, that's where we create the transformative uh, impact that allows us to uh, amplify crop productivity, climate resilience, and, and environmental sustainability. And these are efforts that are beginning to ramp up. Um, it's certainly areas where we need to invest more. Um, and now we're actually think, um, getting into the domain of systems research that enables us to actually be able to harness all of the elements that um, are absolutely essential for us to be able to deliver um, uh, goods and services that have a potential to uh, affect uh, climate solutions. And one thing that, that we've all learned is that science leads, markets follow. Um, this is an example of the Farm uh, Ag Funders 2020 Farm Tech Report that came out earlier this year, um, characterizing the 2019 Ag Tech funding, approximately $5 billion that went across a number of different platforms. Um, this represents startups in ag biotechnology, no novel farm systems, farm management, bioenergy, et, et cetera. 
So the capital is there in the marketplace. Um, the imperative is for us as scientists, researchers, uh, policymakers to actually uh, determine what's the appropriate path for us um, to actually be able to affect the, the change. I kind of look at these technologies as being the, the first generation of that fourth agricultural revolution that we're capable of delivering. Next slide. So there's a lot of opportunity and there are a lot of tools out there. And I think many of us here on this call today are in a position to actually be able to affect that change. Last slide. With that, a short quote from Martin Luther King, great science is compassionate science. Thank you. Awesome, excellent. Thank you so much, Joe, that was wonderful. Um, I can see the questions pouring in, so I would like to turn it over to Jenny to um, start the Q&A. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Joe. Wonderful talk, I, I'm really enjoying all this plant biology talk. Um, so we have several questions in from the audience members. We'll start with the Davy Parker. Davy, would you like to unmute yourself when you're able to and ask your question? I say the omics technologies have been around for quite a while now, and you, you were uh, showing that the uh, cycle time in breeding hasn't decreased. Mm -hmm. So, so what's missing? I mean, there are new innovations coming through, but the, the basic omics technologies have not uh, fundamentally changed. So, one of the things that's actually been missing is that, as you know, biology is noisy, um, and it's very, very difficult for breeders to actually be able to separate um, uh, the actual desired phenotype from a lot of the environmental noise that occurs in this particular space. Um, there have been a lot of attempts to actually be able to uh, address that by just increasing throughput on the front end, such as uh, on the genetics and, and throughput. But the environment is such a compounding um, uh, factor and and the plasticity of the plants has actually made it much more difficult for us to actually be able to, um, uh, again, be able to get our arms wrapped around some of that, that particular uh, noise with, within the system. And the hope, anyway, at, at this particular stage is that with the new sensing technologies and the new uh, data analytics capabilities, uh, that we can actually become much more astute uh, being able to uh, identify uh, those needles in a haystack. The other aspect I would touch on also is where the funding has gone uh, traditionally. Um, so a lion's share of the funding, at least on the private sector side, has gone into um, a very few number, number of crops. So the, uh, the focus has been on a very narrow bandwidth of uh, of particular uh, endpoints that has uh, uh, also limited our ability to actually get more of these innovations into a broader array of food crops. Thank you. Uh, well, if we can, I'd like to squeeze in one more question from Francesca Cotrufo. Uh, Francesca, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Hi, Joe. Um, Hi, it was a, a very interesting presentation. Um, one thing I see is that currently we are addressing this huge problem um, uh, on, on, on two parallel rails, if you want. One is this um, high tech, high precision farming that you have mentioned. And the other is the regenerative farming uh, that the farmers are actually putting in place and companies like General Mills, McDonald's, uh, uh, Indigo are supporting with their initiatives. And even in department, like I have some project with RPI in which we're doing iTech and I have other project with other things where we're doing with Gen. And I, I don't see those two paths crossing, which, uh, you know, I didn't see the world ecology on your slide. Um, and, and I really think that that's where we can make the difference that the only biotech is, sorry to say, but it's one of the problems that brought us here and, and, and we need to integrate that with the ecology to make sure that we don't get into 
an unknown problem in a century from now. Um, excellent point, Francesca. And and I agree with you completely. I use biotech in the context that it's a tool that allows us to actually be able to uh, discover and advance um, genes and traits that are um, in the natural uh, uh, gene pool as well. So whether it's through conventional means or through uh, gene editing, um, we're talking about a particular uh, capability to identify those genes and traits and then be able to move them in the most expedient uh, format. And, and to your point, there's 550 million farmers um, globally, uh, 500 of them um, are farming less than two hectares. So if we're going to have an impact, we have to develop technologies that are scalable to those 500 million.